thanks so much to everybody who's joined us today. My name is Maggie. Um, I am the current chair of AIJ Student and Early Career Professionals Committee, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. We're so excited to have you, and it is you know, my real honor and pleasure to be able to present with our BGC partners on the fundamentals of successfully applying for AIJ, which is um, a daunting but completely doable task, and we're excited to show you how to do that today. What we really wanted today um, is to have a nice kind of casual almost conversation between the three of us to help you be successful in your application for the CIH. Um, there's a lot of components to it, but we want to give you tools and, and some understanding before you leave here today. So our objectives are really to help you to understand and what are those requirements when you're applying for your CIH? Um, you know, there's a lot of eligibility requirements. So what are those, especially as they relate to you, to be able to perform your own self-assessment for the CIH or help somebody else to perform that self-assessment? Um, know how to navigate the BGC website. So you'll be doing your application through their website. So that's a really critical component. And almost most importantly is determining what's your personal timeline for actually doing this application. Um, you know, I think we all know that it, it does have quite a few components and your own personal eligibility will really impact what that timeline looks like for you. Um, and so we're also really excited. We saved quite a bit of time at the end here for Q&A because we're pretty sure that's gonna be something, you know, folks tend to have a lot of questions about this. Um, so please, if you do have questions, throw them in the chat while we're talking. We're really going to try to save those to the end, but we're excited um, to, to answer your questions and, and hopefully all step away with some additional knowledge. <laughs> Today's speaker, um, I am very, very excited to introduce them. They're two wonderful people, um, both from the Board for Global EHS Credentialing, or BGC. So that is the body that actually does confer the CIH credential. Um, so our first speaker today is Dr. Yvette Smith, and she serves as the BGC Application Director. Um, so I know she does a number of things, but mainly that re revolves around managing the application review programs and helping to guide applicants to establish their eligibility. Um, so she also has a really incredible background as both an educator, researcher, translator, um, and attested that in her emails. Um, and, you know, she also has a lot of experience with intercultural issues affecting individuals and international workplaces. Our next speaker is Mr. Jody DeBow, who I can speak from experience as an extremely helpful person. Application coordinator for BGC um, and you know does the CIH as well as all of the other many applications and credentials that they have. Um, and he brings a really strong administration background to this role. Um, so you know, thank you both so much for being here to speak to all of us today. We're really grateful for your time. Before I pass it over to them, um, you know, I just want to give a little bit of perspective. Um, I myself am a CIH and, and got it somewhat recently, 2021. So I really know what the process is like and, and the challenges, the parts that are great, like the BGC team. Um, but I just want to kind of go over, you know, why do we apply and when do we apply? Um, and there's a lot of reasons why we might, might apply to get our CIH, you know, when we're ready to kind of move forward in our career or advance ourselves. And so obviously, you know, I'm, I'm from the Students Early Career Professionals group, but it's not just early career professionals that are applying for their CIH. It's, it's any of us, whether you've been in the field for three years, 10 years, 20 years, more than that. Um, you know, there's never a wrong time to apply and, and show your credential and show your knowledge. Um, but, you know, another reason why you might apply is to push yourself in that knowledge. Um, most of us tend to kind of stick in a couple of different, you know, subtopics of IH um, or we're even generalists. So, you know, this, this test, this exam really requires you to have a broad scope of knowledge um, and they'll speak more to that. But, you know, you are going to have to push yourself, push your knowledge and abilities when you're studying for this exam and really be able to demonstrate that in your application. Um, and when to apply? This is the really hard question. Um, I don't know that there's ever a, a good time to apply, but you know the times when you should think about it are obviously after you've had sufficient time in the field. Um, so for those of you who might not know a lot about what it takes to apply, you do have to have a certain amount of time in the field, but your mileage may vary depending on the degree or degrees that you have, programs you've attended, 
Um, but typically that's going to be around four years. So, you know, you can't just do it a month into starting, but you can start to think about it then. Um, and most importantly is you're going to apply when you actually have the ability to dedicate time. Um, and it's going to be some time to actually do the application and study um, and, you know, make sure that you have folks around you who will support you in this, um, but really just making sure you have that time. Um, and with that, I am going to pass it over to our fabulous speakers here today, um, Dr. Smith and Jody, please take it away. All right, Maggie, thank you. Uh, I'd like to, on behalf of uh, BGC, Jody and I would like to thank AIHA and you and the Student and Early Career Professionals Committee uh, for inviting us to uh, present uh, some of the uh, view of how to prepare uh, the application so that it goes as smoothly as possible. Let me continue with this overview then. There are three sections that we can divide this into, education, professional experience, and the application itself. In terms of the uh, education, you need to have the minimum of a bachelor's degree to apply. Uh, you can, uh, it's easier uh, if you have uh, a, STEM a STEM background. It was supposed to be uh, your demonstration of foundational science knowledge. Uh, if you have a degree in uh, biology, chemistry, engineering, or physics, or safety, uh, that makes it a, a much smoother process. But it doesn't, uh, it, it just means that if you don't have those degrees, any of those degrees, you can uh, present uh, your transcripts and make sure that you have the equivalent of at least 60 semester credits or the equivalent in other systems, uh, 60 semester credits in, uh, in science, technology, uh, or um, uh, math even, uh, engineering and math. So, um, you also need uh, to have uh, specialized training in IH coursework and in ethics. Yeah? Uh, the STEM coursework has to be academic. You have to have a degree, but uh, IH coursework can be academic or continuing education. Yeah? Uh, one distinction I would like to make is for uh, the question of accreditation, which often arises. For U.S. applicants, uh, you can take a look at the DAPIP site. It's the U.S. Department of Education website to confirm that your school uh, is accredited. Uh, is accredited. Uh, that is one level of accreditation that we use. This is distinct from the ABET accreditation, which uh, specializes in, for our purposes, in IH okay. and safety. Uh, so uh, if you have a background in IH or safety uh, and you uh, have an ABET IH program uh, that has conferred a degree, then you can, uh, this, this will uh, have certain consequences, make certain aspects of your application simpler. Yeah? Uh, if you are an international applicant, uh, you should have an evaluation report prepared. Which evaluation report, there are several, you should consult with us uh, and we have our contact information uh, at the end of this presentation so that you can be sure not to make any missteps, uh, what you need. But yes, you would need to have uh, the equivalent of the bachelor's degree uh, in order to, uh, to apply. Yeah? Uh, for, in terms of professional experience, uh, we need uh, you to describe the work that you have done for, in general, four years, 48 months. Uh, you have to have current supervisor, uh, uh, current supervisor reference because you need to demonstrate current practice in IH, uh, and you need, you need to have references from previous supervisors uh, to document at least, let's say, 48 months of professional level practice in IH. And we also need a CIH reference. It is our in-house reference. Uh, 
in order to apply. If you don't have a CIH reference, there are alternatives that you can find on our website, gobgc.org, uh, but you can also reach out to us for that. Uh, there are alternatives, as you can see on the presentation, where you can submit work samples and we can develop that um, aspect uh, in the course of the presentation. All right. Now, working on the application, um, the entire process is done online now. So the application is completed online, um, the PRQs, the references, um, also payment is all done through our website. The PRQ, which is the Professional Reference Questionnaire, that is something that you, as the individual applicant, would send to your supervisors for ref your references to have them complete that for you. Um, that's not something that BGC gets involved with. Those are up to you and your supervisor. Um, another aspect is your IH uh, certificates. So those would be all the continuing education courses that you completed um, to help prepare and either for the exam or for your position. So when you're collecting those, make sure to that the information that it contains has the duration, uh, when it was completed, the title, um, if it has CEUs or contact hours itself listed. Um, but as you take those trainings, make sure to collect those as you go. Um, if anything is missing, you'll want to collect supporting documentation um, to fill in any holes. Otherwise, we won't be able to accept it um, as is. It'll it, Either you'll have to supply the supporting doc, docs or um, complete a different training okay. that can provide that. How many hours do you need to supply for, uh, for IH? One million. <laughs> but realistically, uh, the answer is 240. Uh, you need 240 and you have, uh, we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit, but you need to have uh, broad scope IH training uh, we can accept a certain number of narrow scope uh, IH um, contact hours. Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, now for um, official academic transcripts, that would be um, U.S. or Canada. Those would be sent directly from either the institution, the learning institution, or a vendor. Sometimes the schools will contract out to have somebody handle their transcripts. Um, and they can be sent to BGC via email and or by snail mail. Um, for official evaluation reports, the applicant has to go through um, one or of the two organizations, which is NASIS and AICE, where they would actually convert your international uh, degree and, and courses into the equivalent in the US. And that's how we can interpret um, for the reviews. So official is sent directly from either the institution or a third-party vendor for a U.S. and domestic would be, it has to go through an evaluation company. And we have a list of those um, on our website that can take you to, you have your choice of those. We don't have a preference. It's whatever um, is best for you. All right, next. Okay. All right. So for the timeline uh, for applying, it's never too early. Um, if, if you're going to get started on it, make sure you're giving yourself, you know, some leeway because there are always, there's always going to be something that will pop up. Yes, we do have applicants that um, are on top of it. They are in constant contact with their references. Um, they're able to complete the application. They have all their content. I've had people submit um, an application, had all their PRQs transcripts in within a day. So it really just depends on uh, how much preparation you do and the follow-up needed to uh, get the documentation needed. So again, have all official transcripts uh, sent to us, either, again, email or snail mail. Um, with the evaluation report, there are two different varieties. There's the course by course and document by document. It's listed on the website, but if you're still unclear, again, email us at applications at obgc.org, which is also listed at the end. Uh, make sure to calculate your coursework with care. So that's paying attention to uh, your transcripts. There's usually a legend on the very back that explains how your um, uh, credits or units are calculated. And so that's what you need to go by. Most US institutions go credit for credit. So if you took a three credit course, when you enter into the system, you would enter as credits. Some schools go by units where one unit might be one credit or one unit might be three credits. So just be mindful of that when you enter into CAPS. Um, 
And this is where doing some prep before you start, making sure to organize and list and upload all of your IH coursework and supporting documentation. If there's if something isn't provided and you notice that, then we're going to notice that. So if it doesn't have like the duration or how long you know it the training was or when it was completed or the name of it and what was covered, then you'll want to supply that. Um, and then when you check in with your references, uh, make sure that they are aware of the due date because all documentation is due at the same time. So no later than February 1st for spring and no later than August 1st for fall. Um, and that goes for supporting documentation, trainings, references, everything must be in before that date to be considered for that window. If you miss that, then you won't be considered until the following window. So if you miss that February 1st, it'll be pushed to fall. Uh, make sure to collect um, your proper uh, documentation. Again, if you completed uh, trainings, go to that, that organization and see what information they can provide that would help support your claim for IH or ethics. Uh, locate uh, previous supervisors. Um, that's not something we do. That is you as the applicant. You have to reach out to um, whomever can write that for you. And, um, and you want to give them some time. Yes. Yeah. You, know, you want to give them a few weeks and be aware of the fact that, you know, not everybody can drop everything to write a detailed report as yeah. is needed. Correct. Um, keep receipts for anything that, uh, especially for your transcripts or evaluations. Why? Um, it may come become helpful later on in the process if a, an issue arises. Um, and if that's the case that, you know, you ordered your transcripts a year before and they still haven't been sent, you need to reach out to us. <laughs> this us protects know. you. This yeah. protects you. It helps uh, us allow uh, your documentation to be reviewed uh, because it has come in or it was attempted substantially before the deadline. Okay. Yeah, waiting the day before, um, there won't be any consideration, sorry. <laughs> um, also make sure to plan for contingencies. If you have a supervisor that um, may be retired and you need to reach out to a different supervisor within the company, you know, make sure that you're allowing yourself that kind of time. Um, same thing with trainings. If you have a training that you completed that um, is missing all the important information and all you have is a title, you may need to complete a new training to uh, support your application. So uh, making sure that if you are missing something that you do have the opportunity to complete trainings before the deadline uh, to help you qualify. That includes the supporting documentation. Okay. Uh, I think next slide, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. I, I'm noticing that we have a number of, uh, of questions about uh, from international applicants who are asking about their degrees, about asking about the evaluation reports. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that we are seeing that and I'm delighted to see it, so is Jody, and that uh, what you, it, it would be a good idea for you to contact us at applications uh, at uh, gobgc.org. Uh, to be able to uh, discuss in detail what happens for your specific situation. Uh, uh, we will be looking at certain um, aspects of the IH coursework uh, entries that need to be made. Uh, I see, for example, that what is needed is 240 contact hours, not CEUs, as I'm seeing here. Uh, CEUs is a different system. That would be 2,400 uh, hours. We need 240, that's all. <laughs> but uh, that's what you need. And uh, in mostly in broad scope IH areas, um, uh, the website will give you uh, more detailed information about that as we see here. Um, and, and just to add to that too, you know, having gone through the application, that's where we really encourage folks to plan ahead of time. Um, I know personally for me, I think getting my coursework in order and calculating things out was one of the, the longest parts of the task. Um, so they're giving great advice and, and just be really careful and double check it or email them if you have questions um, well in advance. And, and that way, you know, hopefully you'll be successful on that first round. Right. Um, I do want to mention uh, one question that I see here. Uh, I have processed uh, trainings that took place 20 years ago. 
uh, there is no expiration date. That it does not mean that uh, that training is going to be useful for you for the exam, but it does mean that uh, that we can acknowledge that that training took place at some point. The expectation is that in order to be ready for the exam, you will make sure that you are current in terms of your preparation. But in that sense, the processing of your application can be a little different from uh, the degree of preparation that you present for, uh, for the exam. No? Um, so uh, if I would suggest that the uh, CIH candidate handbook pages and uh, the CAPS uh, system provides a lot of direction and guidance. Please read these carefully. Um, for the supporting information that you need that uh, Jody has mentioned, you want to have third-party official supporting information. Sometimes that is necessary if you have a, a course that is not obviously IH, and we have we see some of those. Uh, the courses with funny titles, if you will, or not so funny, it depends. Courses, for example, as Bring Out Your Dead. Okay, uh, the, the IH content of that is not obvious, but it's there. You, what we would need to tease that out is an official course description, uh, the syllabus, uh, that sort of thing. So if you have taken the training uh, uh, on surviving the zombie apocalypse, no. <laughs> that you have to make the case to argue um, the uh, the IH content of that, but that that information is what we will use to review your application uh, for uh, sufficient broad and narrow scope IH. Uh, I, I mentioned this before. You need at least 120 hours of broad scope uh, IH and no more than 120. Uh, contact hours hours of uh, narrow scope. Narrow scope IH includes uh, asbestos, lead, mold, confined space entry. You know? uh, so uh, you can uh, submit one initial training and one uh, refresher training. If, for example, you have a 40-hour HASWAPR, uh, we can accept that and one of the eight hour uh, refresher trainings, uh, uh, but not your training from 2019, 2020, 2021 and, and current, right? So um, what counts as IH, the big question, uh, what we have found helpful is to go to, again to the CIH candidate uh, handbook pages on the web and, uh, notice the subject area definitions. To the people who have uh, presented applications earlier, they used to call this rubrics, uh, but uh, it is now subject area uh, definitions. If you, if uh, we can go to the next slide, uh, we can see how uh, a detailed explanation of what that is. Uh, among the list of subject area, there it is, thank you. Among the subject uh, areas, you it, the original you will see uh, includes basic science. Basic science is covered by our STEM coursework requirement, which I've just discussed. So these other subjects are uh, areas in which you can present trainings uh, to uh, be creditable to meet the requirement. Uh, notice that all IH is STEM. So the STEM coursework you've taken, for example, academically counts as, uh, counts as uh, well, the IH counts as STEM, but not all science is IH. Uh, notice here on this list, you will see that there are the absence of certain trainings, legal uh, trainings on legal issues, regulatory focus, standards-based trainings, these are not creditable. Uh, they change with the country. So it is important for us to eliminate that aspect from our review. Okay, next.
Now, one thing I want to point out, though, is if we reach out to you for any reason, it's because we want you to be successful. Okay, we are making an effort to help you get through and, and, and get past the, the first review. So if we reach out, it's not to make your life harder. It's because something is missing that will stop you from, uh, you would get a discrepancy email, um, essentially, from the reviewers. So if, if something is reached out, whether it be a name change or supporting documentation for your ethics or IH, it's because we noticed it. That's, that's how I tend to operate. If I notice it, I'll say something. So when we reach out, it's because we want you to get through on that first pass. Um, we aren't trying to throw in a roadblock. It's just, you know, if I, if I know what you're missing and I say something, that's all it is. Okay. okay. Um, with the top picture there is actually showing the uh, CAPS management system. That's what you would use to um, log in, create your application. And this also acts as your dashboard. Um, I do want to say, please remember your username and password, put it in a safe spot. Um, we get a lot of emails about that when if you just write it down somewhere, that would be very helpful. Um, another thing I want to point out is to uh, not use placeholders when you are completing the application, which would be, um, we've had some people upload a blank document just so they could get through the application, and that is a big no-no. Um, it explains what is needed in the handbook pages and also within CAPS. It, it'll guide you through that process. Uh, so, you know, not don't put anything that would be considered, oh, I'll get back to that later. Because once your application is submitted, it's considered official. Anything that gets changed after that um, is, is difficult on our end uh, to allow you to do that. So you won't be able to edit or change anything once the application is submitted which means that you paid the application and it is now closed for acceptance of documentation. Uh, the other thing would be no bulk entries. And by that, we've had people complete um, one entry where they put their um, bachelor's degree at 124 credits. And that means 2,480 continuing uh, education hours. That is not acceptable. You do need to list your coursework for your STEM, IH, and ethics. Um, and no lumps, uh, don't lump your coursework together. So don't put all of your science classes into one entry and say that you had 3,000 hours when you completed, you know, three courses. Um, that, that would be highly suspect. And when you're filling out the job description uh, for your professional level work, please be thorough in your explanation. Um, the more information we have to evaluate uh, the application, and then compare that to what your supervisor are saying, the better. Because if, if there are any discrepancies, anything is missing, we now have to follow up with you, and that's going to delay your review. Because we try to go through and do the first pass, and then when you correct those issues, you go back in line. You don't go back to the front of the line. You go back in the line that's completed. Uh, so don't, um, don't build in those delays. Make sure that you're you're giving us good, accurate information and things are supported. Right. Let, uh, get back to this next part. Okay. The, another aspect uh, is uh, when you present si usted ya saliendo, your no application que is to make the the distinction between academic credits and continuing no, education no, no. hours. No, no, no. If you look no, no, no. at the uh, illustration okay. uh, uh, under the uh, under the caps uh, intro screen, okay. you'll see that there are uh, examples of things sí. that you should yeah, not yeah. do. For example, uh, uh, okay. the okay. comprehensive industrial hygiene review uh, by the University of Michigan is actually 35.5 hours. Uh, it, we, we know this so that when we see that it's being claimed for 355 hours, we see that there is a problem uh, and uh, quite, quite the discrepancy. So, similarly with the toxicology online training by AIHA, uh, I believe that at the time we were processing this, uh, it was six hours. And so to have that become 120 hours is a conversion that we cannot hold with. Uh, this, should, this should 
correspond to seat time. In other words, uh, your six hours should be six hours and not become some other artificial uh, way of calculating things. Similarly, when you look at the different health, uh, the different stressor categories and the different descriptions of your work, uh, there you can see that we need something that is more than one line. Uh, one line is not going to give us uh, the information that uh, that we need uh, to talk about percentages or use numbers or to say that your responsibility is uh, it, that you are pretty accurate. This does not help us. We actually need much more uh, uh, specific detail in terms of what uh, you need to do. Okay, we can go to the next one. All right, for the professional references, again, this is something that you will send a link to your references to fill out. Um, it can only be completed by them. They are not allowed, you are not allowed to send them information that they can plug into uh, the, the reference. Um, that isn't accepted. You cannot write one for yourself. Um, if you'll notice uh, what's considered acceptable with your relatives, subordinates, um, and so there are some that are going to have a family business. So if that that's going to be a challenge. None of those people can write for you. Um, but because you are in a family business, maybe you're consulting, you can use clients as supervisors because you are reporting to them. You are, you know, you're reporting to them. So therefore, they would be considered a supervisor over your work. Um, only one CIH is required. What is this again? Only one. <laughs> uh, more is fine, but not required. I've had some people that they know, you know, eight different CIHs. That's good for them. We do only need one. And please don't feel that you cannot uh, complete your uh, application because you only have one CIH uh, writing for you. That That is plenty for us. Now, one thing that I do get asked a lot um, is, what if my supervisor is a CIH? Well, they can count as your supervisor and as a CIH, but that still only counts as one PRQ. So you will need at least one more or however many it takes to cover your 48 months of professional work experience. So yes, you may have one person that can fill a supervisor and PRQ, but we're going for duration, like how, how much professional work experience do you have that your manager can attest to? And all PRQs, like I said earlier, are due um, as, as long as, I'm sorry, as well as all the application materials. So again, that would be February 1st for spring, which is coming up, and then mm -hmm. August 1st for fall. Okay. Next slide. Thank you, okay. Uh, we've said it already, the CIH candidate handbook pages and the instructions in caps are key. Uh, it's important to read through those probably more than once to, uh, to understand what is being uh, requested in terms of uh, information. We've already discussed supplying complete information, details, specifics, not just numbers and percentages without a context. Uh, uh, normally, a one-line description is not going to be sufficient. Uh, in terms of the work description that you uh, put in, you should have at least two stressor categories that represent your work. That is the minimum. Uh, sometimes it happens that you're working on a grant or there's uh, a problem and you're working with one stressor. You're working with a chemical stressor, let's say. Uh, that is not something that we can accept up to 12 months of what would be considered narrow scope IH. Uh, but what you want to consider is not only what the work that you do, but the work that you are expected to accomplish, even if you are not accomplishing it during, uh, in the course of your work, if it, even if it's not a major part of your work. Uh, you may not uh, be a radiation specialist, but if you are the radiation safety person in your uh, in your company, uh, that would count as a part of the work the of the uh, stressors that uh, you represent that your work reflects. You know? uh, in terms of requesting references, you want to make sure 
to check in with the references and choose people who know your performance of your work firsthand. This is very important. And also people who agree to write by the deadline for you, all right? Uh, we cannot make exceptions. There is no wiggle room. Uh, I'm sorry about that. It's just the way that we need to do to be able to, to get through the numbers that we uh, have to review in a timely way. Uh, it is very tempting to write the text for your own reference. Supervisors can somehow sometimes say, I don't remember quite what you were doing. Maybe you can write this up for me. And then we find that uh, copied and pasted into more than one, uh, uh, one form. This creates all sorts of problems, as you can imagine. Uh, we don't know who is who has authored what document, uh, it throws the, uh, the application process off and it creates ethical uh, questions. Uh, who is writing for whom? So um, this is an important part. Uh, probably also very tempting is to uh, use uh, professional, your professional job description. Uh, but you should, we do not at BGC request your official job description. It doesn't correspond necessarily to the, the actual work that you do. That is what we want. We want to know what your practice consists of. So uh, that is not part of our requirement. Um, and we should also request that your uh, references not use your official job description, particularly if there's more than one writing on your behalf where we get into the problem of duplication. Uh, if you could uh, go to the next slide, please. I'm not gonna to spend too much time with this reference alternative because I, I believe that uh, in this situation, it's not a bad idea to uh, contact us to make sure that everything is, that, that you can submit um, work samples. Not everyone is in a position to do that. Your, uh, the work samples are what you submit if you do not know a CIH who will write on your behalf. Uh, in that case, you should consider uh, the, the set of work samples that we need, three of them from different years that span the years of practice that you're claiming, uh, that you should consider these as a portfolio of your work. It should be a deep and varied level of work that you, uh, that you are presenting. Uh, we don't accept proposals or bids, journal articles, because you may be, even if you are first author, you are usually not the only author. And so we can, that cannot be considered. Um, uh, I, I have yet to see a work sample, a one page work sample be accepted. Uh, you is not a question of submitting data. It is a question of the whole AREC range, anticipation, recognition, evaluation and control of hazards uh, that is uh, important. And I think uh, I would say to present your best work not the, the, the first uh, samples that, uh, that you're looking at, but the best work that you can do to get the best evaluation because these are sent to, um, to practitioners who will review those. Um, next. And one thing I follow screen, up yeah. with um, also on that is think of it as if you were applying for your dream job. Yes. And this is your portfolio work that's gonna help you land that job. That's what you need to submit. Um, the work sample process does extend the review process because we do have to get experts in the field to review this for us. Um, and if you supply, I'll say, bad work that's unusable, then we have to follow up with you again, get that uh, a newer work sample, and then we have to reconvene a, a new uh, committee to review this material. So always submit your absolute best work first time. Don't go five or six rounds because uh, we've had some people that have done that and it, um, it just extends your application process out far beyond what 
it could have, when they would have just supplied their best work and they would have made it through that first pass. So just keep that in mind. Um, we can go to, ahead to the next. Um, now, they're, they're, we're covering reapplicants because there is some confusion about this. First of all, your application is good for two years, which is four windows. Uh, so like spring, fall, spring, fall. If you started the process and timed out, which means you were never approved, you are considered incomplete. So you would have to meet the current standards at that time. We do have some uh, applicants that started the process, let's say 10 years ago, and are coming back to us. They have to meet the standards of today. Right. If you are, uh, if you're an applicant that you made it through the process and were approved, which means you received an approval to test letter, then you are a reapplicant. That is when you have um, the process is a lot easier because we already had you approved. So you're just going to be updating your contact information. You select the pathway um, that's listed on the, on the slide, update your current work experience, and all you need is one current. Supervisor PRQ. Can I hear that again? Only one. Okay. Um, and the reason that's important is we have some that will add 15 references. And the way that CAPS is set up is if you make 15 entries for references, your application will not go under review until all 15 are received. So we only require one current supervisor. That's all you need to request. Once we have that, then we'll be good. It does not have to be a CIH. Again, you only need one current supervisor, uh, PRQ, and then pay the application fee. It truly is that simple. Um, it's also on our website um, in multiple locations, and uh, we're sharing it again right here. <laughs> okay, if you, uh, next slide, I think. Here, we're. I'm not going to develop this. I just want to let you know that BGC offers uh, a number of other credentials uh, in the EHS world. Uh, it happens sometimes that people who have uh, CIHs uh, are interested in considering credentials that reflect their skills outside of IH. And, and I thought I would add this just to see if you do a lot of auditing and uh, work on this, uh, you may be interested uh, in the uh, CPEA and uh, if you do environmental compliance, health and safety, or management systems, that might be something that is helpful. If you do work in process safety, this might also be a credential that you look into. That's all I want to say about that. Um, next slide. Our, our final slide before questions is uh, to show you the range of uh, credentials that we have for the CIH, which we've talked about today, for the environmental professionals, we have the QEP and the EPI. For uh, EA, EHS auditing, we have the CPEA, the Process Safety CPSA, and our more recent uh, credential, uh, if you work in product stewardship, is the CPPS. Um, yep. if, we, yeah. we can go to questions. Um, I've been taking notes kind of just generally yes. from the questions that I, I've seen popping up, and I'll just try to um, hit those topics. Um, one of the questions was about other credentials. Um, there is no credential that is accepted in, in part or in place of anything within the CIH. It doesn't exempt you from anything. Regarding the credentials, if you complete IH training towards those credentials, you would want to um, provide those uh, for review. Um, it's a lot easier to, to tease those course, the IH coursework out of, of the classes that you've taken, and whereas a credential isn't accepted um, in place of. Um, and again, contact us for details on that. For example, if you have a CSP or an ASP CSP, uh, you, uh, you may be able to present uh, training uh, and uh, syllabus that will allow us to give you credit for the IH component of the training that you've had. All right. Um, regarding international um, transcripts, um, all international applicants do need an evaluation report, um, regardless of what the degree is in. Um, something that I didn't touch on. So if, if you took a, uh, courses from different schools that can apply towards your application, for example, let's say um, 
just because this is top of my head. Um, I went to Columbia and took courses and then transferred to Northwood University. Um, you would want the original transcripts from CSU and you would want your transcripts from Northwood. Um, sometimes those are transferred in, but they're not always transferred in in an equivalent. So let's say you took a high level science class at CSU, um, but Northwood only accepted it as a uh, low level science. So you wouldn't get credit for that. We have no way to review. So make sure that if you have multiple uh, schools that you attended, supply them. Um, if you think it's gonna help your application, supply them. Um, but for international applicants, you do need an evaluation report. Um, again, the type that you need is also listed on the website, um, or you can email us at applications at gobgc.org, which will be listed on the next slide. Uh, um, let me talk also about internships. We didn't touch on internships. Uh, if you have internships that received academic credit or that were required as a part of your program, this counts towards your education and it can't, we can't double dip for you. Uh, so it would not uh, normally count towards uh, the time that uh, we would count as professional level. If that is not the case, and this is something you may want to check uh, in with us about, uh, we can we may be able to count the professional time that is uh, assessed by your supervisor for that work period. Okay. okay. Um, one of the questions what is what STEM is. So STEM would be your science, technology, engineering, and math. So if your degree is in one of those, you should be you should meet the uh, STEM requirements uh, for the application. If you have a non-STEM, and that is not within the, the, those four categories, then reach out to us, um, right. again, at applications at gobgc.org. Right. And uh, keep in mind that when you're, uh, when you're deciding what counts as STEM, we use uh, uh, BGC's uh, standards and guidelines for that. And so uh, sociology would not count, psychology does not count as STEM. Uh, so uh, if you have a degree, a non-STEM degree, reach out for us so that we can uh, make sure that you meet the requirements or let you know what you need in order to be prepared to apply for the CIH. All right. Another question I saw was about um, official transcripts um, in that if it's from long ago, um, let's say eight years ago. Uh, so with on your transcripts, even if it's from a while ago, we still need them to be sent through official means. The only way that we can accept a transcript uh, from an applicant is if it's in a sealed envelope. So sometimes you can get a copy as a student from um, the registrar and it's sealed, has the stamp on. You can send that to us as long as you protect the integrity of the envelope. For example, it cannot be opened. So you would want to place it in another envelope and then mail it to us. So that way the integrity is kept and then we can accept it. And this is important because we have received fake transcripts. So uh, it is important that you know these uh, procedures are what we use to make sure that uh, we, we don't have to, no one has to contact you 10 years ago and ask you, uh, 10 years afterwards and ask you what happened with this transcript. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, yeah. And, and also with that, when you're entering the course, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna ask too, you know, there, about entering the coursework, we're getting a lot of questions about your bachelor's and master's and do we need to enter all the courses if you have a master's in IH. Um, and I think that get back, gets back to the credit hours and maybe we can yes. just kind of broadly clarify those again. And, and I can run back to that slide too, just so folks can see what that looks like. Right. Uh, in terms of uh, STEM and, uh, and you want to enter uh, the courses that you took that fall into the, the science category, technical scientific coursework. This does include safety, by the way. Uh, and of course, IH. IH is science, not all science is IH. Um, and uh, you have to meet the requirement of 60 semester credits, uh, of which 15 are uh, classified as upper level. That would be junior, senior, or graduate level. And, and one thing to clarify too is you're only entering the relevant courses 
So the the basket weaving class or you know interpretive dance, those True. are not related. Sorry. <laughs> um, so those you don't have to enter. Just enter the STEM, IH, and ethics courses that are, are required. Um, bolstering it with, like I said, an arts class isn't something that uh, that would work. Um, another area, um, as far as the application, yes, you can start and stop um, as you go. We've had some people that will start a profile, enter the information they have at the time. Maybe they have their coursework um, and they're seeing what IH coursework they may need to do to complete it. Um, that's a, a good way to use CAPS as well. Um, enter all the information that you have, and it'll kind of give you an idea of, oh, I need to take ethics, or oh, I need like uh, eight more credits in IH or 20 hours in IH, that sort of thing. Um, so yes, you can start and stop. Uh, when you submit, um, that is when you actually pay the application fee. That's when it becomes active and it allows staff to upload um, the materials received. Um, unfortunately, we, we cannot confirm or uh, providing information as to what we have received for you. It goes into uh, a temporary holding file until there's an application uh, that we can attach it to. Um, once the application is active, you the same information that uh, we see is what you see in your dashboard. So if you see it in your um, ap application, um, contacting us isn't gonna change anything um, as far as, as what we're seeing, because we see the same thing. Okay, uh, in answer to a question I'm seeing, uh, referring to the CAPS language, and thank you for referring to the, tra to the CAPS language, uh, official transcripts must be sent directly to BGC from the schools. Uh, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't interact with you because of this question of authenticity. Uh, so uh, that's what an official transcript is, and secure e-transcripts can be sent, the e-transcripts can be sent to applications at gobgc.org, uh, official transcripts can be sent by mail, uh, and the uh, the address is is available online. Um, and uh, we don't do partial reviews. We work on completely submitted. Uh, submitted yeah. Yes. So you may it may be complete to you. Uh, the the review will show whether you have whether it is completed as as uh, in terms of what the board requires. Um, regarding the uh, CIH, the CIH reference can come from any time in your professional work experience. Um, so even if the CIH is not necessarily at your current location, um, the CIH reference is what we're concerned about. A Somebody who's retired and um, mm -hmm. was able to witness your, your work can write the reference. They would just document it that they are a retired CIH. They would include their number and the time frame of when they were um, they held the CIH itself. So even a retired member that's familiar with your work can write that for you. Right. Um, and I think it kind of goes to what uh, both of us mentioned within the presentation about um, you can talk to your supervisors about what it is that you did. If that's best. And you want to make sure that they are aware of all the things that you do, because again, they may be familiar that are familiar with your work as one stressor. They don't necessarily know that you might deal ten percent in another, another twenty percent in a in a different uh, strat or different category. So it's good to have those conversations to refresh their memory, help them uh, remember all the different uh, uh, different different things that you handled. So that's that's good regardless of uh, you know being current or a previous supervisor, do okay. talk to them. And another point that we didn't have a slide on, but that is part of uh, part of the training you need to show is ethics. Uh, very important. You need to have now I think a lot of training may cover ethics, but what we need is something that is documented as ethics training. Uh, and you need to show us two hours of that. Uh, that may be part of a course that you've taken. Uh, it might be part of continuing education that you have or that you have through your work. Uh, we And so uh, you need to show us two hours of that uh, and, and that will cover that educational requirement. And, uh, and just to add to that, oh, sorry. Some prep courses, if you're taking a CIH prep course, I know mine actually provided your two exactly. hours, your two credit 
hours for ethics training. Um, I put it in the chat so I know AIJ every year offers some opportunities. There are a number of other organizations and you can typically find, you know, either paid one if you need it right away or um, if you're able to wait a little while, sometimes there are unpaid opportunities even your state local sections for AIJ might offer that um, because they know people are always looking for it for applications and recertification. Yes. That's and, and just to piggyback that, uh, a great example would be, I took a lot of management and marketing classes that covered ethics. So if you list your you know, management 101 course, um, you need to provide the documentation that shows that ethics was actually covered within that course. That's what we mean by supporting documentation. So yes, you know, we can understand that management, marketing, legal can all cover ethics, but we need something within the syllabus, the calendar, um, or the course description to show that ethics was covered for at least two hours. So that's what we ask for in, in supporting documentation. Right. And there is no time limit on that. You, if you did it 10 years ago, you did it. When you are a reapplicant, uh, we're not going to ask you to start from scratch. This is not this, this is not an organization that does that. We, if we have the records, we will work with records that you have uh, what we have for you and uh, guide you to completing your application so that, again, you can uh, earn your CIH because we do want you to succeed and we need your work in this world. Um, another thing I saw on the, the chat was uh, the ATT. Um, when you receive the, eight, um, the approval to test letter, you have two years, again, four windows to complete the exam. If you don't complete the exam, um, either by not passing or not taking it, you would reapply and that would follow the reapplication process, uh, which like I stated, was, is a pretty simple process. I did also see something about CEUs. And so typically if it's uh, listed by contact hour, so if you took a five hour class, which means your butt was in the seat for five hours. Oh. So it's hour for hour. Yeah. CEUs are converted and you can actually use caps when you're entering that in. So let's say it was one CEU, you would select that it was a CEU um, when you categorize that and it'll do the calculations for you in caps. So okay. that's why it's, if you're not sure, that is the best place to go to enter your information and, and get a, an overview. Okay. I know that was kind of a fast run through. <laughs> and I think I've been kind of checking through. I think for most of these questions, we've had them answered. One I do want to check on is we had a few folks asking about um, you know, if they took a course, a webinar, an ethics training some years ago, does it still count towards their application? Is there any time limit on that? So long no. as you provide paperwork, I think that's the key thing. You have to have your paperwork for that. Exactly. That's exactly the, the case. We don't have cutoffs at this point uh, for, okay. for IH uh, training, for your degree uh, in foundational science or the, the training that you will, the academic training that you show for foundational science um, or ethics. Yeah. And uh, I just saw another about do conference webinars count? Um, I think you will have to check. And that's another thing you can always email BGC about, you know, if it says it counts towards this many CEUs, it'll typically say how many contact hours, um, which I think is really what we're looking at here. Um, yes. And you can save again, save that paperwork, save what it's covering. And if you're not sure, send it to BGC. Um, and again, having gone through this, I'm pretty sure I emailed with Jody a couple times. Um, <laughs> they're fabulous to work with. They're really responsive and they do want you to succeed. I, I can tell you that from experience. Yes. Well, um, you know, I think we've answered as many questions as we can, um, just out of respect for everyone's time. I know we have completed our time here today. Just thank you so much to the BGC team, um, Dr. Smith, uh, Jody. so grateful for you two taking time out of your extremely busy schedules to, to educate all of us, answer our questions. Um, I just want to direct people again to to the link on this page, as well as the email here. Um, please reach out, use the resources. They have great resources if you're interested in getting your CIH on the website. Um, we're also hoping um, this webinar is going to be shared. It was recorded. The slides, we'll make sure those are shared. We're also going to try and attach the CIH self-eligibility assessment 
um, and handbook. So, you know, that can also be found on our website and is a great resource. Um, but, you know, just please reach out to them and, and feel free to reach out to myself or the Students Early Career Professional Group with any questions or if you're interested in getting involved. Um, we have a LinkedIn page. You can find us on the AIHA website. Um, but otherwise, I hope everyone has a wonderful and safe day and rest of your week. And thank you so much. Again, thank you. Thank you.